I'd like to talk a little bit about crew competency based upon some of the experiences that we've had uh, recently. Uh, we are the American P&I Club. We have our own experiences with training uh, with our members in cooperation with our members. Of course, our members who sponsor the training that we actually are involved in. So I'd just like to give a few uh, examples of some of the experiences that we've actually had with that of late. So really what we've been looking at, I've been hearing a lot more about it. We've talked about it since SDCW 95, of course, about the issue of crew competency and also uh, looking at what are we trying to do to make up this competency gap. We're sending a lot of seafarers aboard ships. They have the appropriate certificates with all the appropriate stamps, the flag state endorsements and the like. But we do know from the types of claims we've seen, from the discussions that we actually have with our surveyors have with seafarers on board, there is a competency gap. And we do know it's there. So how are we trying to address that issue? and really looking at company assessment and company assurance tools. Now, some of the challenges are associated with, of course, multiple nationalities, uh, multiple languages, various varying training uh, capabilities, just general aspects between differences between different people, and a other wide scale of various qualifications. We know that that has an impact upon differences in crew competency. Training costs. We're trying to strike the balance and really understand the concerns between training people internally within our, the companies, which we know has a certain uh, significant cost associated with it, with basically, or, and on the other hand, trying to bring people in who are properly trained and qualified and educated. And we also know that if we're training people within our particular companies, that they may move on somewhere else where they might get better pay. So there's always that balance in trying to keep people, train people, but then retain those people. It's also uh, an issue that we've been finding with regard to our competency assurance and competency uh, training that we've been doing. And, uh, and the training seminars that I've been doing with our members, we find it very difficult sometimes in, in talking with the members where they, they understand the tools, they understand the necessity of the tools, they love the tools, actually. They like the, 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 uh, the quality of, of what the, what's uh, to be learned. However, in my discussions with them, and when I'm looking at them and I'm talking to them about it, I can see that look in their face saying, we love this, but we're not quite sure how to implement this in what we do. Because we have um, other tasks, we have a difficult, uh, uh, market out there from which to uh, operate in. Costs are, are being uh, scrutinized. So it is a difficult situation for, for us in this industry. And again, as I mentioned, turnover of good personnel is a very difficult thing to manage. Competency, competency assurance, uh, basically, again, it's an issue that really became more uh, targeted, I would say, at least in principle under the SDCW 95 convention. But it was also a good thing, actually. It really started to look at it. It was not just people's knowledge of what they actually knew, but were they competent in actually performing tasks which they were required to perform to safely perform their duties. And that is something that we've tried to focus significant attention on. And of course we train people. Training is necessary for skill development. It's necessary for regulatory compliance. Um, but the training standards, as we find, must define the training outcome. What are we defining as a training standard? What is the training outcome? What do we expect to get out of it? Learning outcomes should be consistent with, consistent with the performance criteria objectives of the workplace. What type of performance do we actually want? Again, we see a lot of people spending a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy in training and training materials, uh, all the resources associated with that, but is it really the proper uh, material and proper uh, training focus that we're actually making? Whether that's before we're sending people on board ship, on board the ship, and also training before, uh, within the companies. Uh, familiarization training is also an issue that we see where this is a particular concern. 
for competency assurance, as we know, this is with anything. Uh, you have a skills uh, retention. Sometimes when you're told immediately, you retain those skills right away. Let's just say that 100% threshold. But we know over time, if they're not repeatedly refreshed, we know over time that they will actually, uh, they will actually decay. Now, if we're not periodically doing and taking our time and energy to refresh people's memories, refresh their skills, refresh the activities in which they're involved in, re refresh the safety culture, uh, environmental protection culture, all the things. It's not just the skills, it's also our ability to reflect as managers reflect to seafarers that we need to it's very important that you do these things. It's very important that you do these things. That without that periodic assessment from time to time, you will have the decay. But if you are periodically uh, devoting time and energy and resources to that, you can maintain and re-enhance them from time to time. But you will also see the skill retention over time actually still improve, okay? It will drop off from time to time, but then it's refreshed. But when it drop off, but when it drops off, it doesn't drop off as deeply as it did before. So that skill retention will increase over time still. So establishing competency assurance, <coughs> excuse me, competency assurance, establishing and maintaining competence requires regular training and practice. It just does. Uh, however, reality in, in the training is the cost. The cost, the energy that it takes, uh, we know, again, my discussions with our members, I ask what their major challenges are. They say it's very difficult to manage it in this uh, particular commercial environment, uh, both uh, pay for training outside as well, but in particular inside the organizations. Uh, it's a difficult uh, challenge. A systematic assessment of that process can identify skill gaps, though. This is something that we were, are looking into and spend our time and energy at the American Club we're really looking about how do we identify skill gaps. And then when we identify those skill gaps, what do we actually do to enhance their uh, competence and competency uh, uh, abilities. So targeted training courses can actually do that, we feel. Uh, I'll tell you about the types of tar targeting, uh, targeted ones that we've done actually within the American Club in a moment. Now, we develop training tools. We've been working for about 12 years with a company, a training institute out in, in uh, Manila, uh, sorry, in Subic Bay. Uh, they actually used to have a train, they do have a training center, but they also have an IT group that we've been working with for some time, IDIS uh, Interactive Technologies. And the subjects that we've been focusing our attention on have been based upon our experiences with claims our experiences with putting surveyors on board ship and having discussions with seafarers, with masters, engineers, and the like, uh, and seeing what their competency levels are on, uh, are in and, and where it, there could actually be improvements. And also targeted uh, uh, regulatory requirements when something uh, very important comes out, something very new uh, that we find which would be uh, of assistance to actually have some competency training, like we've recently just finished our Marple Atlantic 6 which we postponed for a couple of years because of all the changes that were going on and letting that dust settle. But we've, uh, we've done that recently. But I'll give you a list of those in a moment. And also one of the things that we found was very important is to actually have a management system, a real-time management system which uh, can track uh, seafarers, where they actually are in their, in their particular skill sets, uh, what types of training that we can do in order to track their competency along the way. And also helps not only whatever we're training them with on the, on the, uh, the uh, e-learning tools that we've developed, but also other areas in which they can be, uh, uh, it can be identified that they actually need additional competency training or training uh, to a particular competency level. We also have a plug and play system. We've had a lot of discussions with our members. They say it's wonderful to have e-learning tools which people can work with when they're ashore but we know sometimes they're not doing that. And we have their devoted attention when they're actually uh, on board ship. And that we have a, a separate plug and play system for our training tools in which that's all can be done on board ship. Now I've heard the opposite also, that they have too much on board ship to do actually. 
But my biggest concern, as I try to joke with them, I'm more concerned about them doing the training while they're at home and they have their 15-year-old competent, you know, uh, uh, son who's, you know, you pay him 20 bucks, 20, pay 20 euros, and he does it for him, okay? So there are different issues that we have with regard to this competency training. Uh, with regard to ensuring that it's being done by the right person under the right circumstances. But we have found overall that the best way to do this is via plug and play system, which is on board ship. Captain and Chief Engineer can manage this. So, uh, establishing and maintaining competency requirements require regular training. It absolutely, did I do it the wrong way? Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm hitting the, I miss. Yeah, sorry, it just seems like a, there's a missing, my apologies, there we go. Uh, just real briefly, I'm, I'm sorry I'm saying this is safety for c but actually we were just recently evaluated and given the C-Trade Award for the Innovation uh, for Investment in People Award for our uh, e-learning e tools that we've developed, which are basically, as I mentioned, uh, we have an online system. Uh, I'm very proud of it. it. We have very competent people who have prepared it and invested in time and energy into it. It started with pilotage, which we found, uh, this dates to my days at Guard prior to joining the American Club, that we see someone in the order of about 50% of contact damages between ships has a pilot involved in one form or another, or at least the pilot was on board, uh, whether awake, asleep, or out at, on his duties, but we have found that that's the case. Uh, for, and so we invested time and energy in doing case studies on that particular subject. We also find, very unfortunately, and even in this day and age, as often as we see it, uh, entry into confined space uh, uh, risks. We still lose seafarers or entering confined spaces without looking into the, the proper uh, or t not taking the proper precautions, and it's stunning. We lost five seafarers about a, a year ago on the most ridiculous, uh, under the most ridiculous uh, circumstances. Uh, one of the worst cases that we've had, uh, all, in one, all in one shot uh, in a cargo space. Uh, so we continually reinforce this particular issue. Uh, we have also completed all six um, uh, uh, annexes of MARPOL. The whole e-learning tool process began with the e with the MARPOL Annex 6, I'm sorry, MARPOL Annex 1 because we're seeing so many cases with regard to oily water separators and the like and so on and so many cases that would be brought to our attention at the American Club as it's brought to other IG clubs although there are issues with regard to how we actually cover that or do we cover that so those matters uh, so that was the first thing we did a lot of time and energy spent on oil record books how to complete them properly and so on so a lot of detail in actually how we go about this so here's another uh, I won't continue on down the list but we have addressed a number of issues. We're continuing to address more and more as they arise for, uh, for us. So, in summary, training takes commitment and patience, not only for developers, but for members. We do understand the issues. We understand the problems. Again, from our perspective, we're trying to work with members and, and try to w find the better ways in which we can help them enhance their, their training needs or enhance to, to uh, help them with their training needs. Training needs to be more relevant and focused. Uh, just we found that uh, training people, uh, just broad stroke across the surface, and people who are particular, who are supposedly competent, have the right certificates and the like, we find is insufficient. They need more time. They need more uh, uh, focus on, on particular areas that really need to be uh, where their competency needs to be uh, enhanced. We're committed to doing uh, to developing and maintaining such tools. Um, and another thing that we've been seeing, I'll just close on this, more and more I'm seeing in, in my discussions with people from particularly on the, with, uh, in the oil majors, they're focusing a lot more on competency, particularly in their vetting. And actually, how are they defining that? How are, or how is that actually being done? Uh, quite a discussion with that, at least in the, not, not during the presentations at the last Intertanko uh, meeting in Houston. Uh, but there seems to be a, a particular focus on this. So it's an issue that our, that our industry really needs to spend more time and energy uh, focusing attention on. 
and we hope to do so in cooperation with people like yourselves. Thank you.